In the autumn of 1944, World War II was raging across Europe. The Allied forces were pushing deeper into German territory, and a series of battles were being fought as both sides vied for control. One such battle stands out as a testament to the ferocity with which armored units fought from both sides. This is the story of the Battle of Puffendorf, a showdown between American and German armored forces, that took place on November 17, 1944. Puffendorf, a small German town nestled in the heart of the Rhineland, was about to witness a fierce clash between massed armor from both sides. The narrow streets, centuries-old buildings, and open fields provided an unusual battleground for armored warfare. On one side of this clash, stood the formidable German Panzer divisions, equipped with their Panther and Tiger tanks, ready to defend their homeland at any cost. On the opposite side, battle-hardened soldiers of the United States 2nd Armored Division, driving the reliable, yet often outclassed, M4 Sherman tanks. The M4 Sherman medium tank, was the principal American tank of World War II. During the war, about 50,000 were built to supply both American and Allied troops. It proved mechanically reliable and mobile, just like the M3 and M5 light tanks. It became the workhorse of the United States Army, providing close infantry support, spearheading armored attacks, anti-tank missions, and serving as supplemental artillery. Its 75mm main gun, however, lacked sufficient armor-piercing capability, and it sacrificed firepower and armor for improved mobility. The tank became rather obsolete, by late 1944. Despite the availability of a few Shermans upgraded with a high-velocity 76mm gun, most medium tanks continued to use the short-barreled 75. They were clearly outgunned by the enemy's largest tanks, the 63-ton Tiger, as well as the 50-ton Panther. The Tiger, the Panther, and even the medium Panzer IV, all boasted thicker armor plating than the Sherman. With larger tracks than the Sherman, the enemy tanks also had more flotation, which could sometimes negate the better mobility, that US tanks had when on firm ground. The Sherman's only advantages were superiority in numbers, comparatively easy maintenance, and increased flexibility in speed of fire, due to a gyro-stabilizer and power traverse. During the First Army breakthrough battles in July and August 1944, the Second Armored Division tankers had learned how to fight German Panther and Tiger tanks, with their M4 Shermans. They were aware that the 75mm low-velocity shells used in most M4 Shermans, couldn't pierce the thick frontal armor of Panthers and Tigers, regardless of the distance, but could damage the sides and rear. Yet, they had suffered devastating losses. For instance, during the period from July 26 to August 12, 1944, a tank battalion from the 2nd Armored Division had seen 51% of its combat personnel either killed or wounded, and a staggering 70% of its tanks, had been either destroyed or sent back for extensive repair. However, through clever flanking maneuvers and strategic use of artillery support to fire directly on enemy tanks, the American forces emerged victorious in their battles, inflicting substantial losses upon the Germans. When the Ruhr Offensive kicked off in November 1944, the Second Armored Division had managed to enhance its firepower to a certain degree. Approximately half of the division's M4 tanks were now equipped with the more potent 76mm gun. Using this upgraded firepower and the new tungsten carbide cord HVAP ammunition, tank crews could pierce the Panther's front belly plate from 300 yards away, with a reasonably good chance of penetrating the front slope plate at a distance of 200 yards. But this ammunition was in critically short supply. 
Additionally, the division's tank destroyer battalion had recently been equipped with the new M36 destroyers, armed with the powerful 90mm gun. On the morning of November 17, two tank battalions from the 67th Armored Regiment of the 2nd Armored Division were getting ready to attack toward Jurienswiler from a slope outside Puffendorf. Preparing to launch an offensive towards the village, soldiers in the 1st Battalion observed elongated high-velocity shells cutting deep grooves into the soft earth between their tanks. Emerging from the thick morning mist, a German tank appeared on the scene. Soon after, two Tigers and four Panthers emerged from the woods on the western outskirts of Jurienswiler. The deadly exchange began. A Sherman tank was struck, erupting into flames, followed by another, and then another, as the Germans accurately zeroed in on their targets. Before long, the tanks of the 2nd Battalion were also suffering losses due to the relentless fire from the formidable German tanks. The Germans, surprised by the rapid progress of the American advance on the first day of the offensive, had quickly deployed units from the battle-hardened 9th Panzer Division, veterans of the Eastern Front, to Jurienswiler. They were launching an assault on Puffendorf, with a force estimated by the 2nd Battalion to consist of around 20 to 30 Panthers and Tigers. The battle in Puffendorf unfolded as a fierce tank versus tank engagement, with infantry forces on both sides pinned down by relentless artillery barges. The Germans held the upper hand in terms of positioning, as the Americans were confined by the terrain's steep slopes, rendering flanking maneuvers impossible. The Shermans put up a valiant fight, courageously engaging the enemy and attempting to exchange blows with their 75 and 76 mm guns. However, tanks that ventured close enough to bring their guns to bear on the enemy, were quickly eliminated by enemy fire. Even when American tank crews managed to land direct hits on the German tanks, their shells would often bounce off the thick armor, soaring skyward with a deafening scream. It took an astonishing 14 rounds of 76mm ammunition from one Sherman, before it finally found a vulnerable spot on a Tiger. But in the very next moment, another Tiger tank annihilated the Sherman. A single combat report captured the essence of the action. Sergeant Julian Chekansky, a tank commander in Company D, spotted a German tank and fired at it with little visible impact. Meanwhile, tanks on the right flank were under heavy fire. Lieutenant Carl's tank burst into flames, yet miraculously, all five crew members managed to escape unharmed. The draw was overcrowded with tanks, leaving little space for maneuvering. Two enemy Tiger tanks and four Panther tanks were spotted emerging from the woods on the western edge of Jurienswiler, shrouded in the persistent mist. A veil of bluish smoke descended into the draw, and two additional medium tanks on the right side were quickly engulfed in flames. Then, within a matter of minutes, four of the lighter tanks were ablaze. With some companies dwindling to less than platoon strength, and ammunition supplies running dangerously low, the 1st and 2nd battalions made the difficult decision to disengage and retreat to the outskirts of Puffendorf by 1600 hours. During the withdrawal, Sergeant Chikansky's tank took a direct hit, injuring him and causing the vehicle to burst into flames. The task force regrouped in a defensive position to safeguard the town against potential recapture. Chikansky's platoon leader, Lt. Pendleton, found himself at the outskirts of the town, parked in a lane. His tank had only one armor-piercing round, two smoke rounds, and six high-explosive rounds left. Pendleton spotted a Panther tank moving across his path, but realized he was not in a favorable position to engage in combat. 
However, the crew of the Mark V tank had also spotted him, and as the Panther advanced, it opened fire. Pendleton's gunner promptly fired two smoke rounds, causing the Panzer to withdraw. However, it returned shortly afterward. In response, Pendleton unleashed four of their high explosive rounds, with one accurately hitting the driver's hatch. This hit convinced the Panzer crew to retreat once more. As some companies found themselves reduced to just three or four tanks, and with dwindling ammunition supplies, both battalions urgently called for the 90mm tank destroyers to advance and provide support. Lieutenant Cecil Honeycutt's platoon, from the 702nd Tank Destroyer Battalion, was taking position, when suddenly, the Panther re-emerged and fired an armor-piercing round down the lane, narrowly missing the leading M36 tank destroyer. Honeycutt swiftly maneuvered his tank destroyer into position, and unleashed two rounds at the Panther, effectively putting an end to the immediate threat. The German forces were further deterred by artillery fire, which resulted in the destruction of three King Tiger tanks in a single barrage. The newly introduced M36, equipped with a formidable 90mm gun, was facing its first major battlefield trial. The 90mm gun, had the capability to neutralize the Panther and Tiger tanks at typical combat distances. However, when dealing with the imposing King Tiger, it usually required the coordinated effort of two or more M36, and often necessitated a side shot even under such circumstances. Nevertheless, it's worth noting that on November 19, north of Frieldenhoven, a single M36 crew achieved the remarkable feat of disabling a King Tiger tank from a distance of 1,200 yards. The 90mm round punched through the turret side, passed entirely through the breech ring of the 88mm gun, and came perilously close to piercing the far turret wall. As the day drew to a close, the American tanks received orders to retreat and seek shelter within the stone structures of Puffendorf. Surprisingly, the Germans did not launch a counterattack. Their shortage of infantry, difficulties faced by their own tanks in navigating the soggy, rain-soaked terrain, and intelligence indicating the arrival of the 2nd Armored Division's Combat Command A, along with the 66th Armored Regiment on the evening of November 17, all contributed to their decision to hold back. Despite the Germans' failure to capitalize on their advantage, they effectively halted the 2nd Armored Division's advance for a full two days. It wasn't until November 20 that sufficient ammunition and reinforcements arrived, enabling a successful three task force assault on Jirienzweiler. This offensive was preceded by concentrated artillery barrages. Subsequently, it took another six grueling days of fierce house to house combat in Merzenhausen, before the 2nd Armored Division finally reached the Ruhr River on November 28. When the smoke finally cleared over Puffendorf, both sides had paid a heavy price. The town lay in ruins, a testament to the fierce battle that had unfolded in its streets. The second day of action on the Ruhr Plain took a heavy toll on the 2nd Armored Division. They lost 18 medium tanks and 7 light tanks, all destroyed, with a similar number damaged and rendered inoperable. Tragically, 56 soldiers lost their lives, and 281 were wounded, while another 26 were reported as missing in action. The Americans reported that they had successfully destroyed 17 enemy panzers during the engagement. The American tanks faced a challenging ordeal during the Battle of the Roar Plain. The tank crews, hindered by the difficult terrain, muddy conditions that prevented flanking maneuvers, congested areas where they typically received artillery support and adverse weather that limited air support, displayed tremendous bravery. However, they had grown disheartened and disillusioned, regarding their tank's capability to overcome German armored forces. 
Just two days after the Roar Plane Offensive, a sentiment among the 2nd Armored Division tankers emerged. Our men no longer have the same level of trust in their armor and guns as they once did. Another added, the Germans have shown continuous improvement since our encounter in Sicily, emphasizing the need for action from our Ordnance Department, to keep pace with the evolving enemy technology and tactics. This wasn't just a fleeting response from soldiers weary from battle. After the war, a report from the Armored School, developed in collaboration with tank commanders from the 2nd Armored Division who had been part of the Puffendorf action, concluded that the primary reason for the setback on November 17 was the inferiority of our tanks in terms of guns, armor, and maneuverability. During the Roar Plane Offensive, the tank crews couldn't help but notice the German tanks' distinct advantage with their wide tracks, which barely sank into the ground, while American tanks left trenches in their wake. The tankers expressed their grievances, citing that Shermans were too sluggish to quickly evade anti-tank fire, that their volute spring suspensions hindered maneuverability, with most favoring the torsion bar suspension for its superior maneuverability and reliability, that their profile was too tall, and that their armor didn't offer much more protection than that of the tank destroyers. Most notably, the tankers voiced their frustration about their tank guns. They had witnessed their 75 and 76 mm rounds bounce harmlessly off the front armor of Panthers and Tigers, like hitting them with a pea shooter. While the 76 mm gun represented an improvement over the 75 mm variant, it still lacked the necessary velocity to keep the tank out of the effective range of the more potent German tank guns, which could reach out to 3,000 to 3,500 yards with deadly accuracy. At practical combat distances, the 76 mm gun, even when using HVAP ammunition, often failed to penetrate the Panther's glassy plate effectively. Tank commanders voiced their dissatisfaction, asserting that, the guns are ineffective, the crews know it, and it affects their morale. They pointed to the British approach, where they had replaced the 75mm guns on their lend Shermans with 17-pounders, as a more effective solution. The tankers from the 2nd Armored Division firmly believed, that their own Shermans could easily accommodate a 90mm gun, offering a substantial improvement in firepower. 